So now let me introduce our speaker, uh, Karen. He, she is currently a data science initiative postdoc fellow at Harvard in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science. Uh, Karen earned her PhD at uh, Stan uh, PhD and Masters at uh, Stanford University in computational and mathematical science uh, engineering, working with Professor Greg Greg Broda, who is our alum. So you have many connections with us. Um, and um, Karen's uh, PhD thesis focuses on developing new algorithms to detect weak earthquake signals in a big data set. So you will have many collaborators after your talk. And uh, prior to her PhD, <coughs> Karen uh, uh, worked for the Biodefense System Group at MIT Lincoln's lab. So is there any people from Lincoln lab today? Okay, never mind. Yeah, normally we have uh, audiences from uh, Lincoln Lab. So yeah, so don't worry, you have so many connections with us, so they will not attack you. So yeah, let's welcome to uh, welcome Karen to give her talk about big data for small earthquakes. Is this, okay, is this, can you hear me? Move this up a little bit. Is it working? Okay, it's working. Um, all right, so today I'm gonna talk about um, I, I, as Chen mentioned, I'm now a postdoc at Harvard, but I just started this month, so the research I'm going to talk about today is a work that I did during my PhD thesis at Stanford. Um, and so, so I just wanted to start out by sort of giving you kind of the big picture message that, I'm, that I want you to take away from the talk. Um, and that's that this is a really exciting time, I think, to be doing research in geophysics and sort of solid earth geosciences. <coughs> um, geophysics is a very inherently data-driven field. We can't actually cut open the earth and look inside to understand the physical processes in the interior of the earth. And so in order to study the interior of the earth, we rely on um, often collecting data from sensors on or near the surface. And <coughs> so in this field, scientific discovery is often coming from our ability to extract information from these observational um, and sensor data sets. And these are often very massive data sets. Um, and so I think that um, what I hope you take away from the talk is that techniques from data science like machine learning, data mining, and these methods that are being developed in other fields, I think are really going to present new opportunities for us to use these methods to understand what's going on inside the solid earth. Um, so the problem that I focused on in particular for my PhD research um, was the problem of earthquake detection, um, which is a fairly foundational problem, I would say, an important problem in earthquake seismology. Um, so earthquake detection is the problem of identifying um, seismic signals from continuous ground motion measurements that are recorded oops, by um, seismometers. This is like an old version, but you get the idea. Um, and so we want to be able to extract those signals to basically identify when and where earthquakes have occurred. And the data product that we're trying to produce is essentially an earthquake catalog, <coughs> a list of events, when and where those happened. We want to make these catalogs as complete as possible. Um, so the most commonly used method for earthquake detection um, is a method called STALT, or it's an, what's called an energy detector. And this is a really simple approach. Um, people have been using this approach for decades. Um, and the idea is, in order to detect the arrival of an earthquake, we want to look for rapid increases in the energy of the signal. Um, this is uh, one of the nice things about this method and why it's so widely used. It's very easy to implement. You can run it in real time. Um, and it does well for finding these very large events with impulsive arrivals. The downside of this approach is that it can miss small events with weak signals, um, events that are emergent and don't have impulsive arrivals, or also events during complex sequences where you may have many events occurring in a short period. So as a result, we can see that at the lower magnitudes here, magnitudes two and three, there's a gap between the number of events that we expect to observe and the number that are actually recorded um, in the USGS earthquake catalogs. So we have, there's a lot of potential to do better with these methods, um, or do better than these methods, sorry. And so why do we actually, if the, these are smaller events, why, why do we care about them? Um, coming from sort of the data science point of view, my thoughts are if, if we give scientists better data, they're gonna be able to draw better conclusions. And one example of this um, is a study that my colleague Claire Yoon 
um, who was at Stanford with me and is now at the USGS, looked at earthquakes in um, Arkansas, the guy Greenbrier sequence in uh, 2010. The sort, of, um, the sort of typical catalog had 75 events in it, so not very many. These went down to magnitude 1.2. Um, when she reanalyzed the data uh, with more sensitive detectors to be able to find more events, she found 14,000 events, so 200 times as many. Um, and with this more complete catalog, she was able to identify spatial and temporal correlations between these events and the individual <coughs> stages of hydraulic fracturing stimulation. So actually found events that were related um, to fracking and not just wastewater injection. So this is the conclusion that she wouldn't have been able to reach just using the sort of standard catalog that didn't find these very small events. This is just sort of an example of how small earthquakes can help us and why we want to detect them. All right. Um, so in order to improve upon this sort of STLTA energy detection model, um, a popular approach that um, people have taken in seismology is to use waveform similarity for detection. And the idea of waveform similarity is if you have earthquakes with similar sources, like these two sources here, um, they're going to produce similar waveforms when you record them at a, at a fixed location. So these are examples of five waveforms recorded over a period of six years um, near the Calaveras Fault, um, which is in San Jose. And you can see that all of these waveforms are nearly identical. So the idea here is that if we knew this first event that happened um, in <coughs> November 2007, that could help us to find all of, detect these other events since the waveforms are very similar. And this approach is called template matching. So the idea is to, yeah? Were those amplitudes scaled or were they? Oh yeah, these are scaled. I just, it's to make a pretty, pretty picture. Um, <coughs> yeah, so if you, the idea is to use, if you know the waveforms, you have an event you know and you have the waveforms, you can use that to find um, other events that have similar sources. And so here's an example of a multi-station template. You have events where you know what the waveforms look like. This allows you to find um, very low signal-to-noise events. You know exactly what you're looking for, um, and you're able to find very weak events as a result. Um, now, the, the limitation of this approach is that it's not general. This uh, approach allows you to find events that only have sources that are very close to events that you already know. So if you have a good catalog of template events, if your earthquake catalog is complete, this method will work really well to find um, additional events. But you can't really discover events with new sources using this approach. And often, the template or the catalogs of events that we have in an area are incomplete. And so they, this is limited in terms of what it can find. Um, sort of an initial attempt to generalize the idea of template matching to be able to use waveform similarity to detect new events was a method called autocorrelation. Uh, there's another thing in signal processing called autocorrelation, but this isn't the same thing. Sort of unfortunate naming. But the idea of autocorrelation is to do an exhaustive all-to-all -all search and find similar waveforms in that way. So we can think of this as using this kind of waveform pattern matching, but we're doing it without templates. Um, this is a more general approach, but this really didn't catch on as a technique for detection because it has poor scaling properties, and so it really can't be used on very large data sets, maybe a week at most, um, but otherwise it gets sort of prohibitively slow. So this technique wasn't widely adopted and hasn't really been explored in terms of um, the algorithms behind it and all of that. So that was sort of an initial attempt to improve on template matching. So we have all these different sort of algorithms that are out there. STALTA is a widely used method, but it, we want something that's more sensitive. Template matching is more sensitive, um, but they can't find new sources. Autocorrelation can find new sources, but it's just too slow. And so the question is, can we do better? Um, and so in order to answer this question, we wanted to look at methods that are sort of haven't been traditionally considered within the sort of earthquake detection seismology community, which are techniques from um, machine learning and data mining. And so I'm just gonna give like a quick introduction because I know not everyone is familiar with machine learning. Um, so machine learning is a, sub, um, is a subfield of artificial intelligence. And the goal in machine learning is really to have algorithms that are sort of learning from experience. And experience in this case means data. Um, and so machine learning, you can think of it as these are a set of tools for automatically building models and being able to re recognize complex patterns in your data set. Um, machine learning, even though it's sort of a, a subfield of artificial intelligence, it also draws heavily from applied statistics. And so methods like linear regression, logistic regression, and PCA, which probably, or sorry, principal component analysis, um, which many scientists have probably seen before. I think most people have done linear regression model before. Um, these are 
examples of sort of very simple machine learning techniques. So machine learning is something that you've probably all done before, even if you didn't realize it. Um, and we also are going to sort of consider, I sort of grouped this under the umbrella of machine learning for this talk, is uh, data mining, which are tools for extracting um, patterns from large data sets. And so these are, this is closely related to machine learning sort of overlap. There's not really a good clear definition of what data mining means. Um, but it's a, it is a related set of tools, and they're generally for finding patterns in large data sets. Um, and so uh, these are the kind of techniques that we're going to look at. And so why do we want to consider these kind of methods for solving earthquake detection? Um, these methods have sort of two key properties that I think are really useful for us. Um, one is that the outcome that we get are data driven, and the other is the ability to generalize. So what do I mean by that? Um, energy detectors like STA, LTA, this is an example of a method that's not data driven. So this method, it doesn't adapt or improve by seeing more data. So if you run STALT on one day of data, or you show it a year of data, you show it sort of past results, it's not going to improve. It's, it's not improving based on past observations. It just kind of does what it does. Um, template matching um, is a method that doesn't have the ability to generalize. So the idea in template matching is that we can find more uh, weaker events, but using these template waveforms. But it's the method essentially memorizes these template waveforms, and it can't find anything else. It only knows sort of one thing, and it's this collection of waveforms that we've showed it before, and it can't find generalized beyond those. And it doesn't adapt either, does it? Um, well, it, it doesn't adapt, but if you give it more templates, it will do better, right? So in that sense, it's data driven. It's driven by the set of you, the data that you give it. The more data you give it in terms of the number of templates, the better it should do. So it's, it, this is somewhat data driven, but not, um, but it's not adapting and it's not generalizing yeah. in that way. Um, so these are examples of techniques that, you know, we, we have these sort of limitations and these are things that we want to get out of our machine learning and data mining approaches. Um, so seismologists have actually been using um, machine learning methods for earthquake detection for decades. Um, this isn't something that's new. They've used artificial neural networks, which is sort of the simplified version of what people now call deep learning um, for tasks like um, signal classification, so identifying earthquakes versus explosions um, for detecting events, and also hidden Markov models, which are another uh, class of detectors. So these have been around for quite some time. Um, but I would argue that there's a lot of new opportunities and that these sort of techniques um, deserve another look. So there's been a lot of recent developments that have created new opportunities for using machine learning and data mining in um, seismology. The first is the availability of massive seismic data sets. Um, so in recent <coughs> years, networks have been growing. There's more both permanent sensors and temporary deployments with thousands of sensors. We have a, a large number of sensors, so we call that a large N sort of detection. Um, the data sets have also, we now have longer duration data. And that's because starting you know, 10 or more years ago, it got cheaper to actually store the full continuous record rather than, they used to just store like the events that they knew about because they couldn't afford to like keep all the records. But now we have the full records for, in many cases, 10 or more years of data at a single station. And so that gives us um, long duration data. And finally, there have been a lot of research looking at new sources of data, um, sources like fiber optic cables, um, detection using distributed acoustic sensing, or um, detecting using the sensors in your smartphones. And a lot of these new sources are um, very common sensors, but they're sort of noisy. So you get a signal, but it's not as necessarily as clear of a signal. But it is sort of a new source of data that we could extract information from. So we have a lot of data. And on the machine learning side, there have been a lot of recent developments um, that have made it sort of an exciting time to look into the new methods. Um, one example I mentioned before is deep learning. These methods are useful because if you have a large amount of um, labeled data, so data where you um, have, they have annotations, um, you, they, they're highly effective because they also automate the process of extracting features. So you don't have to sort of engineer the right features for your data. It, it incorporates that, and this is an example from a recent paper that's using this for detection. Um, but there's also been a lot of work on uh, machine learning for time series and sequential data coming out of um, communities like natural language processing. Um, there's been work about how to learn from with smaller data sets, and also work related to making models more interpretable, incorporating physics into them. Um, and I think those are of interest to scientists as well. So this, this is an area I would say machine learning in the last five or six years has really exploded in terms of just the amount of work in this area. 
and new developments. Um, and related to that are improvements in computing technology. So part of this sort of explosion in machine learning research has come from the, oops, the ability to do um, machine learning with GPUs, um, and that's really been able to speed up the ability to train with very large data sets. And also it's gotten increasingly easy um, to do machine learning without having to have like a PhD in machine learning um, because there are open source tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch that make it much easier to use these tools. When I started my PhD, these were like research code and it was very hard to use them and now they're much easier to get started with. Um, so there's, these are sort of new opportunities, I think. I just wanna say machine learning is sort of a, a set of tools. It's not a single um, approach. And so when you're thinking about what tool you wanna use, it depends on a number of different questions. One is what is the task that you're trying what, are, what do you want to use it for? Um, do you have labeled data? So in our case, labeled data would be, for earthquake detection, would be template waveforms. Do we have events that we know this is an earthquake and this is not an earthquake? Um, and how much data do you have? How big is your data set, both in terms of the data that you want to process and the size of your labeled training data? And if your goal is to make predictions and you have examples of labeled data um, of the sort of behavior you want to predict, that's called supervised learning. Um, Deep learning, or a lot of the excitement in deep learning is basically doing supervised learning on very large data sets with very large training data. And you can build a really complex model in that way. Um, in other cases, you may not have labeled data, and your goal is to identify certain patterns of structure in your data set. And those would be things that you could do with unsupervised learning and data mining. And all of these different kinds of techniques have been applied to the problem of earthquake detection or seismic signal analysis. Uh, but we're going to focus on this one up here which is um, a data mining or pattern mining technique that we're gonna use for earthquake detection. So this is the case where we don't assume that we have template waveforms or labeled data, and we're gonna, we want our method to work on very large um, unlabeled data sets. All right, so does anyone have any questions up until this point before I like jump into our method? I just am curious, in the labeled data sets for mm -hmm. earthquakes, how much data do you feed in where you say this is not an earthquake versus data that says this is an earthquake. I was imagining most of it is the latter case, where right? um, Yeah, so, well, in our case, we're not using the labeled right. data, but when people do, usually, usually methods work better when, so if you have multiple sort of classes that you're trying to decide, like earthquake, not an earthquake, or earthquake, not an earthquake explosion, um, you would want to have, usually it does better if you have roughly the same number in each class. Um, so, and also the, it depends how many you need, depends on what algorithm or what method you want to use. Like if you want to use deep learning, you need a whole lot of all of them. Um, if you want to use something with linear regression, you don't need very many. Um, all right, so any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, the, the project or our attempt to tackle large scale earthquake detection using a data mining approach. And I just want to acknowledge that I did not work on this project alone. We had, I had collaborators in um, the geophysics department and the computer science department at Stanford, who um, I worked on this project with. So our method that for detection is um, called fingerprint and similarity thresholding, or FAST. Um, this is a sort of reverse engineered acronym, so we call it FAST. Um, I don't really know what fingerprint and similarity is. <laughs> These are all relevant words to our method, but there's fingerprints, there's similarity, there's thresholding. But, um, the idea in this is we want to take the idea of template matching, where we have waveform similarity, gives us a very sensitive detector, de very sensitive detector, and we want to use that as our basis for detection. So we do want to keep this idea of waveform similarity in mind to help us detect. So similar earthquakes should produce similar signals, and by finding these similar signals, that's a way of detecting events. Um, in this case, we're going to approach this as an unsupervised problem. We don't want to assume that we have template waveforms. And the reason for this is that sometimes um, we don't have very many known events in an area. Uh, it also may be that our, our template, our collection of templates could be incomplete or they don't cover the area of interest. In cases like I showed um, the example with induced seismicity, you may not have much of a record of past seismicity in the area. So in order to sort of deal with this problem, we decided to just make our technique unsupervised um, <laughs> for those cases. And what we do in this case is we look at the problem of earthquake detection in a little bit different way. Um, we ask the question, um, or detection task, is the question of how do we find all pairs of similar waveforms in the continuous data? So this is sort of a little bit different framing of the question than your sort of typical, like, which are the earthquakes? Um, and this particular task of finding all pairs of similar items 
in a large data set is called similarity search or near neighbor search in the data mining or um, information retrieval community of computer science. So this is sort of an existing class of problems, which is fortunate for us because that means computer scientists have come up with efficient methods for um, tackling this problem. So early research in this area of finding similar items in large data sets. Um, the earliest examples come from sort of the search engine community. It corresponds to the early days of the internet. And they wanted to come up with search engines that didn't have the same page over and over again. Um, so to improve search engines, they wanted to find duplicate web pages. Um, it's also was a lot of the early applications were finding plagiarized or copyright content. Um, and an example that was of particular interest to us was using this to identify songs. An example of this would be an app like Shazam, where you sort of play a, a song is playing and you record it on your phone and it tells you what the song is. And this, in, this example is of particular interest to us because of the similarities between audio data and seismic data. It's not perfect, but it's a lot more similar than like web text on web pages. So um, we look to this as sort of our starting point. And we, um, so we adapt our technology for what's called the content-based audio search and retrieval, or basically what Shazam does. Um, <laughs> using a method, actually it's not Shazam, but it's a method called WavePrint, which was developed at Google that we adapt. Um, but this was um, a very widely used audio, um, audio uh, clip identification algorithm. And one of the advantages that we get from this is that um, this is a scalable method because it uses a technique, a data mining technique called locality sensitive caching, and it doesn't perform an exhaustive search like the autocorrelation method, which was kind of an initial tab attempt to um, approach earthquake detection or to make sort of a more general uh, alternative to temple mapping. So um, I'm going to walk through the, the detector for a single channel, and then I'm going to talk about how we extend it over a network. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah? What's roughly the um, time scale? You know, the waveforms that you compare, I mean, maybe you'll talk mm -hmm. about it, but how long are they? Like, um, I would the say, yeah, so I would say generally 5 to 20 seconds would be the length of the windows we would consider. Um, so when you say is 20 seconds the same waveform, like 20 seconds should be repeated. Let's yeah, so it would, be, it would be 5 to 20. So we're looking mostly for sort of local and regional events. Um, what about, I mean, well, I guess you said that you were interested in lower magnitude events. Yeah. I mean, I assume that, you know, the lower your magnitude is, mm -hmm. basically the more difficult it is to find 20 seconds. Of just yeah, so 20 seconds, what usually we'd use, typically we would use smaller amount, like um, usually it would be more like 5 to 10, so I would usually use 10 as sort of the, the default. For the study with induced seismicity that I showed, um, where Claire was finding these really low magnitude events, that was closer to 5 seconds. Um, so it, it is related to, to that, but we'll sort of come back to all, like, all, I'm going to go through yeah, all, yeah, all of the details. Um, all right, does anyone have any questions sort of about the, the setup? All right, so. <coughs> Um, I'm going to give sort of an outline of how the approach works and then go into more detail about each of the pieces. So the input that we have for our method is just the single channel continuous ground motion data. We don't give it any templates. We don't tell it anything about which data are earthquakes and which are not. We're just feeding it the data. Um, then FAST has sort of two key steps to it. The first is fingerprint extraction. So we take our continuous data, we break it up into these little sliding windows. And for each one, we extract a set of features that we call a waveform fingerprint. Um, this term fingerprint comes from the audio literature. They have this, they call them audio fingerprints when they extract features from, from these sort of segments of audio data. So we have these waveform fingerprints that are features that represent each waveform. And then once we extract our fingerprints for each um, window in our continuous data, we put all of those into um, a sort of fingerprint database. And we search this database in, base in an efficient way to find all pairs of events that are similar to each other. Um, we get an output that's a sparse matrix that tells us it's just each non zero is indicating which of these fingerprints are similar to each other. And from that, we're able to distract, extract our detection results, which are pairs of earthquakes that are similar to each other. How much do you specify what that fingerprint looks like, to say, is it? That'll be the next. Okay. I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'm going to explain how these steps will work. So I just wanted to give you sort of a big picture, like where I'm going with it, so we don't get lost in, in the weeds. So the window length, like the 20 seconds, has already mm -hmm. been specified? Yeah, that's something you have to do from the <coughs> And it's set. overlapping, so the yeah. matrix is the same size number of points as the wave, as the recording? Um, it's usually, so usually we, we don't have it quite as many, like we do the sliding oh, window might be every second, even though the sample is okay. 100 hertz. 
Um, all right, so I'll go into more detail, and then maybe maybe it'll answer some of your questions about the, the specifics. Um, so we have the continuous waveform data, this is the info. We usually apply some bandpass filtering to it beforehand. We usually don't just give it like the raw data. And that's just to remove any sort of um, frequencies that are not of interest or any sort of correlated noise. Um, so bandpassing in, in advance can help um, to the frequency range of interest can help with our, improve our detection. Um, then we, we take, for, we do to use a sliding window. So this is usually about five, 10, 20 seconds. Um, in length, and you take a sliding window. For each sliding window, we, ext we extract these features called the waveform fingerprint. What's important about these features or this sort of feature extraction process is that if we have two waveforms that are similar, we need their fingerprints also to be similar, because otherwise nothing is gonna work. Um, and if we have waveforms that are not similar to each other, like this waveform and this sort of random noise, their fingerprints should not be similar to each other. And that will allow us to use these fingerprints as the features in our search rather than the waveforms directly. Um, and so we, we call this property fingerprints being discriminative for similarity search. Um, How many fingerprints do you have typically? I mean, you, you, you get a <coughs> catalog number of fingerprints? And, and you, and you specify that? So you speci we specify um, when we do this, we, when we use a sliding window, we specify the length of the window and also sort of the, the step between them. So typically we would use like a half or one second step between each window, so you would have one fingerprint per second. No, I'm, I'm just wondering, when you have a given waveform, how uh -huh. many fingerprints do you get out? Or how many fingerprints do you typically you need? I mean, is it a single fingerprint, or is it How many kinds of fingerprints? How many features are you extracting from one Like, second? what is the dimension of this? Yeah. Um, so this, this is... For one window, just for one section, is there more than one fingerprint? No, there's, so for each sliding window, we have one fingerprint, but the sliding windows may contain, like there's overlap between the windows. Yep. So they may contain overlapping data. And then this fingerprint, so this, we sort of show it as like a square, just for visualization, but this is uh, 64 by 64. Is that um, essentially time and frequency or something? Yeah, reflects? yeah, so so we'll see in the next step how we, how we get this. So we, Actually, rather than working directly in the time domain, we convert to the time frequency domain. So we use the spectrogram. And here we have a linear scale. And audio, they use like a log scale, but we, we just used a linear scale. So that's one difference between audio. And this is modeled after the wave print algorithm. So we've, we've taken that as a starting point and sort of modified it. So we, we actually compute the spectrogram, and then we take a sliding window from the spectrogram. And we call that a spectral image. So each segment of the data maps to a spectral image. Then we apply a wavelet transform, the 2D discrete Haar wavelet transform, um, to the spectral image. And Haar wavelet transforms are a sparsifying transformation that are often used for image compression um, and denoising. So we apply the wavelet transform. This is, again, something they do in the wave print algorithm. Then we've actually added a new step called coefficient standardization. And this is, um, I'll explain in more detail on the next slide, but we're essentially normalizing each coefficient based on the distribution that that coefficient takes across the whole data set. I'll come back to why we do that. Once we have our standardized coefficients, we take the ones that are the largest in magnitude, um, and we encode just their sign, or we just keep their sign, and then we encode that in binary. And so these are sort of the steps that we take to get from the wave, each waveform to its fingerprint. And so the only difference, real difference between this and the waveprint algorithm is we've added this step here. Um, and the reason why we add this step is basically due to a key difference between audio and seismic data, which is that if you're using an app like Shazam, um, you're not really recording just like static and sending it for identification. Whereas in earthquake you know, detection, most of our data is noise. And so we, our data is dominated by noise and this uh, sort of affects the efficiency of, of this approach. So we found that this, when we have data dominated by noise, our, um, the feature representation that you get out of just using the wave print unmodified is fairly inefficient. So you have a small subset of coefficients, about 16%, that are selected all the time, and you have 50% that are never selected, which really means only a third of your coefficients are carrying any meaningful information, and that's not very efficient. So what that means in practice is that if you have two samples that are noise, because we're really only selecting among a third of these coefficients, we get a lot of overlap. So the, the red and white are the sort of um, active coefficients, and the red ones are the overlap between these two events. So you can see there's a lot of overlap. If we do this adjustment step, we do the standardization, then it makes the coefficients more evenly distributed. Um, and so what we get is we have our noise have a lot less overlap and are less similar to each other, and we get a lot 
less false positives, and it makes it easier to distinguish the earthquakes from the noise. And when we do this transformation, it's important to note that um, when we've been able to empirically uh, show that when we do this transformation, we don't hurt the similarity of the earthquake signals. It's just lowering the similarity of the noise. And so this was sort of a, a new step. Um, all right. So once we do this, for every sliding window in our continuous data, we extract a waveform fingerprint. And then we're going to put them all into a fingerprint database and do an efficient search. And the technique that we use for this efficient search are called min-hash and locality-sensitive hashing. And this is doing a fast approximate similarity search. So the locality-sensitive hashing is what's called a randomized algorithm. So it works sort of probabilistically. So you have probabilistic guarantees on being able to find um, events that are similar to each other. And then what you get in exchange for not being a, preci a precise guarantee but probabilistic guarantee is that it's much faster. And so how this works, I'm going to sort of explain it using an analogy of a filing cabinet. So what min hash is, you can think of this as this is a, an indexing scheme to organize a filing cabinet in a really efficient way. So if we organize, we take all of our fingerprints, we extract, uh, we take all of our waveforms, we extract the fingerprints, we organize them efficiently in our filing cabinet. Now if we have a new uh, waveform, we want to find which, which um, other waveforms are similar to it. We extract um, its fingerprint, we look, we use Minhash to find its index, which is this, the folder that it's mapped to, and we just search within this one folder to find similar waveforms. And with Minhash, we have the property that the similar fingerprints are going to be mapped into the same folder with high probability. So we only have to search this one folder rather than having to do sort of a brute force search, which re requires us to actually go through the entire cabinet and check every folder until we find a match. In this case, we have to do a much lower number of comparisons. And since it's probabilistic, we actually have like a series of filing cabinets just to get redundancy and better guarantees. Um, but this is sort of the idea of how the search actually works. Um, so when we do this, what we get is an output is a sparse similarity matrix where each row and column correspond to one fingerprint and they're organized um, by their timestamp. So they're, these are sort of ordered by the timestamp. Um, this is very sparse because all we're going to see out of the similarity search is the pairs of fingerprints that have high similarity. We don't compute the similarity of every pair, where we only get the ones with high similarity back, and so those correspond to the non-zeros. And one thing you notice here is that these non-zeros kind of align along these diagonals, and the reason for that is because we, because we have a sliding window, we actually can get multiple sequential detections um, if we have a pair of waveforms, and so that's what these features um, indicate is that we've just seen a pair of events and each one has multiple fingerprints that make it up. So the first step that we had to sort of, this is a, a new step that wasn't in the original publication and we've added is actually extracting these diagonal features. Um, and we call that event pair extraction. It's not a very creative name, but the idea is that we, we don't care about the individual fingerprints that match, we care about which events match each other. And so we're actually extracting the pairs of, of events that are similar to each other at a single station. So in fingerprint two times running down the page, and in fingerprint one it's running running the other direction, running left to right. Um, yeah, these labels are. Yeah, this right. is kind of made up yeah, from a bunch of fingers. It's, it's <laughs> and you are, I assume you somehow suppress the fingerprint finding itself. Yeah, yeah. So this is like a subset. This isn't the full matrix. This is like a zoom in. It's just sort of a schematic. It's, right. Yeah. So you actually would have like only half of this, and the other half would be. So we have some condition where we only do one of the pairs. Um, and then this is just zoomed in so you can see because we actually, yeah? Are those uh, actual examples of uh, earthquakes that you find? Um, these ones, so this is probably an example of some earthquake, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to this. This is sort of a figure to, to illustrate. But yeah, these are the, the kind of things, like these would be similar to each other, and I think these are actual detections from fast that we found at some point, but it doesn't necessarily correspond. So what would happen if you ran STLT on those waveforms? On these ones? I don't know if these are were new events or not for these particular examples. This this is just sort of a diagram to illustrate. But I don't I don't remember we've had this diagram for years now. <laughs> but the the idea is that, that you can so we, we may have some of these events maybe events that um, that are stronger, but there's also weaker events. I have in the extra slides, I can show an example of what like a really weak detection, how that would look on here. Um, but these might be stronger detections. Did you, did you tell us how you define fingerprint similarity? 
Uh, no, I didn't. So the fingerprint similarity, yeah, that was something that, that got But cut. it's insensitive to time, and that's why you get these streaks. So the, the similarity between <coughs> two fingerprints, if I go back, um, I'll show in this example. So we use a measure called the Jacquard similarity, and this is a measure of set similarities. And what that what is essentially doing is it's taking the um, the intersection of the, so we take all the the white and red ones these are the active coefficients they're non zeros if we take the intersection or in this case the red um, the intersection of the non zeros over the union of the non zeros between the two and that's the measure of the Jacquard similarity and we use that because um, this this idea of locality sensitive hashing this is sort of a general concept and there's different hash functions. Um, that you can use to implement localities and hashing. And min hash is a function that works with Jacquard similarity. So not every similarity metric can maps to like look at. There isn't necessarily a locality and hash function for every similarity measure, but for Jacquard similarity there is one. And that's the one that they use with wave print. So we stuck with that. Um, we also <coughs> looked at some other some other um, metrics as well, but for different kinds of fingerprints. But for these sort of sparse fingerprints, Jacquard similarity is a good measure of the similarity of sparse, um, sparse fingerprints. If they were dense, then we would want to use a different measure. But somehow it um, jives with what a seismologist would say. Those two. Yeah, yeah. So I can I can show. I have some <laughs> exercise where I can I can show. Okay. I, I have some. Yeah. Because you're pretty so far I, removed from. Uh, yeah. So it's true. The and then one of the things. So as <laughs> coming from a math background, one of the things that. The, bothers me a little bit about the fingerprinting is that I don't have like a mathematical model and guarantee that this is like, you know, somehow that what we're doing is completely justified doing this series of transformations. Yeah. I would like that, but since we don't have like a good a good model, we have to show it empirically. And I can show, I in the extra slides, I can talk more about that. Um, all right, so so then we, so anyway, we the output that we get are these pairwise detections. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is the example I showed before, um, this example with induced seismicity, before I said there were 14,000 events, of those 13,000 of them were found using FAST. And the others were found with template matching. So in this particular event, there were only 70, or in this region, there were only 75 events in the sort of official catalog, and FAST was able to find 13,000 events. So this is just with a single station detection. Um, and so, um, so we find that it actually works, it's fairly sensitive. Um, does anyone have any questions before I move on to how we do this on multiple stations? All right. Um, so we need to extend this to multiple stations. Essentially, when we have this idea of waveform similarity, the problem that we have is that it's not really true that any time you find waveforms that are similar to each other, they're necessarily earthquakes. You can have similar signals that are not from earthquakes in some cases. So we call what we find candidate events, um, but some of these candidates may not be real. And so we can see an example here. Here's two sort of stronger events. We get this pair of events that are detected. In this case, we get, here's another event pair that we found with FAST. And these just correspond to sort of narrow band noise that end up being flagged as detections in this case. So some of our event pairs are false detections and some are real detections. And the way to um, separate those is that if you have a likely earthquake, you're gonna, you should see it at more than one station, hopefully. Um, these sort of local noise sources should be local, and so they should only show up on one station. And this is really important, this, I, this question of false detections, as we extend to really long duration data sets, because if we have too many false detections as we run on really big data sets, we're not going to be able to pick out which are the real events. We're going to be over, we could easily become overwhelmed by false detections. So we want to make sure we have a way to reduce those. And so we have this multi-station version of FAST. We start out with a single station detector, and we actually apply it to each of the stations. So that's our sort of starting point. We apply it separately to each station, and then we combine, oh sorry, we do this event pair extraction. Normally this, that part goes with this section of the top. Um, and then we have this method called pairwise pseudo association that, that we've developed to actually group the detections, combine them from multiple stations, and then we just have this other extra step that we need to get our final detection list called event resolution. Um, and the reason why this is why we need to do network detection, why it's a challenging problem, is because unlike in, in template matching, for template matching you already know your sources, you already know your move outs, so you kind of get network detection for free. Like you already know where to look and you can make multi-station templates, no problem. But we don't have templates, we don't know where our sources are, we don't know what the move outs are. And so we actually have to identify as part of our network detection problem which of the arrivals we're seeing at different stations. 
are coming from the same event. Um, and so in the context of energy detectors like STA, LTA, this step is called phase association, and it's usually done by solving for a sequence of event sources that will explain the observed arrivals. Um, and then you can say anything that's not explained by our sequence of sources is a false detection, and that's kind of how you would proceed. But we want to see if we can do um, something that's going to be more effective, that's specific to FAST, um, instead of using just the sort of standard phase association algorithm. And so in order to, to come up with our method for defending this over a network, we go back to our detection model, which is waveform similarity. And we, before, we've been focusing on this similar waveforms part. But we get these pairwise detections with similar waveforms. And what's important is these have similar sources. And this is useful for, to us in extending fast over a network. And the reason for this is because since our pairwise detections share the same source, even though we don't know anything beforehand about what the sources are or what the relative arrival times, we know that for e each event in the pair, they should be roughly the same because the events have the same sources. So that looks like this. We have an event. We have our waveforms. They have move out over the network. We have an event with a similar source. They have similar waveforms, but they also have similar move outs. And what this means is that we have, if we look at this, um, quantity that I call the inner event time, the time between the first and the second event in the pair, um, that's going to be the same for all the stations. So the first, the first and second event, or the first observation of the event waveforms. These are going to be the same over the network because the move outs are the same in both cases. So this is going to give us sort of a constant quantity that's associated with the detections of the same event over the network. And I have this sort of little animation that hopefully will sort of illustrate why that's helpful. So we have our two events. We see are there are two events that are similar to each other. We see them over the network. Now I'm just going to add some like extra detections on here. So if these weren't color coded, it wouldn't be obvious which of these detections were coming from the same event. But if we look at this inner event time quantity, and we sort of oops move these over here, we can see that only these three are the same length or it's the same inner event time. And that helps us to see that these are all coming from the same um, source, whereas each of these is just sort of an single event is only being seen at one station. And so this is our approach that we're using to extend fast over the network. Um, we call this technique pairwise pseudo-association. Pairwise because we're keeping our pairwise structure of the detections when we're doing this association. Uh, we call it pseudo-association instead of just regular association because people associate the term association with this idea of estimating the sequence of sources. And so we're never estimating what the sources are. So we call it pseudo-association so people don't get confused or upset with us. Um, and the idea is just to group the, these pairwise detections based on this inner event time qu quantity um, across multiple stations. So we can see again here, all of these should be the same amount of time. This is 915 seconds that elapsed between the first and second detection. What this looks like in our sparse similarity matrix is this corresponds to a shift along the diagonal coordinate. So for these events, this is all like real data. Um, this is the actual, in this case, these are the actual waveforms that actually go correspond to this section of the matrix. And they're color coded by station. But we can see that each station um, is along the same narrow diagonal, but they're sort of offset because we don't have much overlap in terms of the, the temporal overlap of the events. So to do network detection, we now really just have the problem of finding these sort of offset diagonals in our giant sparse similarity matrix. Computationally, it's a little bit tricky just because it's stored in sparse matrix format and you have to do some work to like extract these sort of features, but that's what our network detection algorithm really comes down to. In the end, um, we have this last step. I'll just mention quickly that since we have pairwise detections, we just want a, a list of detections. We don't really care about the pairwise uh, detections in the end, so we may have three events and we may have three pairs. We have pair A, B, and C that we get out. Um, what we really care about is that we've seen the, these three events, and so we just need an extra step to kind of group everything together. Um, so that's more for completeness than anything else. Um, and so how does this do? I tested this um, on the four shock sequence before the 2014 Iquique earthquake. Um, this is applied to five stations and 17 days of data. So it's not a huge data set, but a small data set made it easy to test. Um, and so in this case, um, the local catalog, um, the Chilean Seismic Network catalog, had almost 600 events. And then with FAST, we found almost five times as many events. Um, and for our FAST detection catalog, we required that we had to see the event at at least four out of the five stations. So we apply sort of a conservative criteria here 
Um, we only included if it was at four of the five stations. And this station here was like not that great, so it was usually the culprit um, <coughs> like when we didn't find it. And so when we did this, we actually found that the <coughs> false discovery rate, the number of false detections among the set of um, events we identified with FAST was less than half a percent. And most of those were like real events, but someone might squint at them and sort of question. So this is actually kind of cons being conservative about estimating. So by requiring that we see an event at four out of the five stations, we essentially eliminated the number of false detections. And at each station, I would say the number of single station detections were often about um, maybe four to five times as many. So there, if you only look at one station, there were a, a lot of false detections, but it's hard to quantify exactly how many of those are real and are not. Um, but anyway, we found a large number of events, more than almost five times as many as the catalog, and um, just- you Seemed to miss events with FOSS down in the southern portion. Yeah, so these are events that were in either, so these are either in the, ca the um, USGS or the Chilean catalog. And the reason that we missed some of these events is that we have to have like pairs of events. So FAST, this is one of the, the sort of downsides. We, we view it as somewhat complementary to other techniques. So you have to have two events with sources close together. And so these events are a little more isolated. And so they're events that we might expect to miss. So we found 95% of the events that were in the catalog, but we missed 5%, and that's what those red, red dots are. You, you, you don't estimate the location of the events. No. How, how do you locate your events? Oh, so these are the events that we found that are in the catalog. So we didn't locate like the extra events. These are just showing um, the events that are in the catalog. So it's just mostly for kind of a visualization. Um, but you're looking at differential arrival times. You could do a different. Yeah, we, we could. It was yeah. just that our, the, the point of this was mostly in the, for this particular paper, I wanted to get an estimate of how many false detections. Yeah. And so we compared to this catalog. There's also a template catalog um, that was available. So we were comparing to that. I also sort of manually inspected a large number of events. <laughs> um, as a source of eye strain, <laughs> staring at them on the screen. Because um, you have two of them, and so you're like, are these similar to each other? Um, anyway, but it was just trying to get an estimate of what this false discovery rate is. So comparing the locations, this was sort of like a, a plot more to sort of help me, and we put it in the paper. But yeah, we didn't locate all of all the events because our interest wasn't necessarily in like studying the sequence. I mostly was trying to validate mm -hmm. the method. Yeah, you focused on the If you did want to try to um, so I think so uh, I I would say in this case like we're never gonna find events if there's only one event at a particular source so one of the things that we sort of view fast as being useful for is it's a good method for finding templates and new sources but I wouldn't say that it's like the only method you should ever run on your data set like it also often doesn't find the larger events just because like they often don't have waveforms that are there aren't other events that are similar necessarily so um, STLT will usually can find those big events so this will find extra it, it can find events that template matching might not be able to find because you would have to know the source already. So again, with template matching, you can also only find events if there's two at the same source. But we can find sources that we didn't know about before. And so one of the things that you can do is we can use FAST to find new sources, and then we can actually use those as templates. Because template matching is still a little bit more sensitive, because you know exactly what you're looking for already. So, um, so you can usually do better, because you can sort of tune it to, to reduce the false effect. OK, so back to finish up. Um, so the, we've also been working with our collaborators in the computer science department to get the code scaled up so that we can run it on much larger data sets. And this network detection code, we've incorporated it into that um, as well. So the largest data set we've processed is 10 years of data. This maps to 300 million fingerprints. I think it's like 320 something. Anyway, it's, but we have 300 million fingerprints. So we're finding, trying to find all similar fingerprints within a collection of 300 million. And we can run that essentially overnight. So this is 16 hours. This might have come down since then, actually. I made this slide a while ago. And we've been, they've been, you know, continually working on it. So this is, but this is pretty fast. If you want to process 10 years of data without any templates, find new events, and you just run it overnight. Um, and they were able to speed, help speed up the code by doing a better mem memory management. So one of the sort of limitations of this approach is that in order to create these fingerprint databases, you have to have a really large memory machine. And so by doing better memory management, you can speed up um, the code. And also doing some parallelization, like parallelizing the queries, 
parallelizing this sort of network detection step. And so our code is available. I'll put this back up at the end. Um, what is P, the journal uh, that recognizes? 